a separate reporting here. Okay, so I had noted that I'm hoping to address the issue of calibration. And calibration weaves together as a topic, a set of these topics we've been covering, the impact of, of or, or the selection of a baseline, commonly we calibrate our baseline run, our kind of run as it, as it has come to be of the situation in the world, a description of the situation in the world, um, uh, as it has been historically kind of uh, up till now, we'll often calibrate parts of that to best make, to make sure that it accords with what we see historically. So we can have confidence in our model, that our model reproduces the patterns we see from the world well enough that we might, for example, entrust it to help us interpret patterns we see from the world reliably or help us ask what if questions. Um, so it brings in elements of, of the baseline. Uh, it also brings in elements of stochastics because when we're calibrating, we are gonna have to deal with the fact that a given run of the model with a specific set of parameter values may elicit different results over time. They may differ in their details. They may conserve, they may maintain and variant certain broad features of the situation, but they typically differ in the vagaries of exactly when an outbreak peaks in one area compared to another, you know, exactly how many people are seeking admission to the hospital on any one day, et cetera. There's flukes, there's chance, et cetera. And we have to take that into account when we're matching historical data from the world, because we only observe one realization from the world, one way that it happened to come to be out of what might have been many possibilities. And if we're going to calibrate to match things in the world, we it behooves us to, to bear that in mind and not condemn a model before it's time because we think it's off base when it could have reproduced what we see in the world and it just didn't happen to on this particular run. So it weaves in aspects of stochastics, the issues of stochastics. It also weaves in issues of sensitivity analysis and parameter uncertainty because calibration for several reasons, calibration is one of these processes that we undertake for parameters about which we're most uncertain and which are impactful. We'll often seek to calibrate them because they matter for the things we care about and because we don't know what value to assume. And, and well, at least start with a default value where the model best accords with what we see in the world. And then we will often further perform sensitivity analysis on it. And often calibration by performing it forms that basis for a subsequent uh, sensitive analysis. But often what we calibrate has been informed by our previous sensitivity analysis where we're kind of getting a sense of what parameters really have impact. So calibration brings together many of these pieces. And just to make this sound less ethereal, I. I'd like to show you two models, if I may, that will make some points about calibration and, and situate us. So with, with your leave, I'm going to turn back to my AnyLogics and we will load in and run two models. Okay, so uh, I will turn back to screen sharing here and spare you the indignity of, of my mask and face. Um, and I'd like to, to go first to an example model. So if you go up to help and you choose the example models, here you will find under examples, whoa, okay, what am I doing? 
So I can double click on this tab and make it all full uh, screen. And I'm going to scroll down uh, and I'm going to go to SIR agent-based calibration here. Here we go. Click on it. Okay. There we go. Now, this is a model package up in any logic to illustrate the basics of calibration with an agent-based model. And the idea here is, is a simple one with deep ramifications. So when we're dealing with system science models, we're dealing with models where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and where they exhibit surprising behavior. And one of the foremost watchwords of that surprising behavior, one of the foremost consequences is we see emergent behavior. And this is true for a, a nonlinear compartmental model. It's true for agent-based models. It's true for discrete event simulation models. We see emergent patterns resulting from that that can't be tracked down to any one piece of the model. They, they come from many pieces of the model. The result of emergent behavior. And while we can inform our assumptions about parameter values independently on a, on a parameter by parameter basis and about the structure of the model, often we have a lot of data from the world on things that are in some sense also emergent. We have data on maybe case rates. We have data on hospitalization. We have data on people being found as positive by contact tracing. We have data on deaths. We have data on the number of people in the ICU at any one time. We have data from wastewater levels of, of, of virus. And all of these, are patterns from the world that, that don't tell us about any one quantity, one parameter on themselves in our, in our model. They're, they're the result of a bubbling up. They're generated, we expect them to be generated by a set of other processes. We can't go from from you know the number of people in the hospital overnight, the over the overnight ward census, to information about recovery rates directly, it doesn't tell us the recovery rate. It doesn't tell us the mortality rate directly. It doesn't tell us the contact rate. But it, it's surely impacted by all of those in some tangled way, and these models help us capture that tangling, right? Um, wastewater levels don't directly tell us the transmission rate right now, but they're strongly affected by that. They give some measure of the number of shedding people in the population, which is very close measure, so very closely related to the number of infected people, which is strongly affected by the transmission rate right now, but it's not quite the same. So most things we deal with from the world, most data we observe from the world is data not about one little piece of the situation, but about the, the entangling of many pieces. And, and that data is, is like gold for, for dynamic models because dynamic models produce these emergent patterns of their own. And when we build a dynamic model, we want to have explanatory value from the world. Often we look for it to reproduce those patterns from the world to, to produce the number of cases over time that looks like the world or the number of people in the hospital overnight who looks like things in the world or the number of people passing away from COVID that looks like data from the world. And with agent-based models, you can look at even more detailed things. You know, the fraction of people who have had two vaccinations thus far um, who have uh, ended up in the ICU for more than 
three weeks or what have you. Um, we can have longitudinal measures that are emergent from the model. And while for things like decision trees, for example, we, we try to elicit from, from observations in the world, particular values of specific parameters to plug into that decision tree. For a, for a, an, an, uh, a system science model, uh, a dynamic model, we do that, but we also look, we also look to data from the world that can cross check that dynamic model, can challenge it, can, can, can help us understand, is it doing a good job matching these emergent patterns or not? And, and we can in fact carve out values of parameters that best match those emergent data from the world. So let's see this. This is the process of calibration. Let's go, let's go see this. So here's this SIR agent-based calibration. So here, if we double click on person, we'll see a person starts susceptible, they go to infectious, they go to recovered, and then they, they hear of a waning of immunity. Um, I'm not sure if your version of this model uh, has a waning of immunity. Um, we modified it at some point together. Uh, if it doesn't, you might want to change it to to be uh, one over a uh, hundred here. But initially, we're actually going to to be a rate of one point zero divided by hundred, for example. But for right now, we're going to ignore this. Okay, so we're we're actually going to not not use this, and we'll we'll come back to this point uh, in a moment. Okay, so. So here's our model at an individual level, and these people are going to be placed together, and they're going to be laid out in a in a grid, uh, and uh, individuals are going to be able to communicate to others nearby them their infection. They're going to be able to spread that infection, um, and in fact, they're going to spread it to to random people in the in the population here. So we're going to go run this thing called calibration here. And the calibration is going to take some historic data shown here in yellow, and it's going to try to change model assumptions involving two specific parameters, parameter involving contact rate and a parameter involving uh, the uh, the the duration I think uh, the infection probability, um, so that it best matches this, and so this is data like we might observe from the world, and what we're going to try to do is try to try to adjust our assumptions about the contact rate and the infection probability, so that the model best reproduces this data, and it's not that that will tell us the true values, but at least it tells us some plausible values. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna run this now, and what we'll find is that the model's trying to find assumptions about these two parameters: contact rate, and infection probability. In fact, you see them right here. They'll allow it to best match this, but you'll notice that it exhibits this rather frenetic behavior. There's this kind of blue curve sort of flipping around at various points. And, and each of those instantiations of blue curve represents one particular realization for a specific set of parameter values. And it's trying to find the specific set of parameter values that allow the best, best match to this data on average. Um, so of all the realizations. And so it's got to deal with stochastics. It's got to deal with the fact that for a given, a given um, assumption about parameter values, uh, it, it may have different types of outcomes for different realizations. And you'll notice it's learning over time. It's, it's actually getting better and better in its match. You'll see it's, it's, roughly getting closer here as it's honing in on parameter values that allow it to 
better better match and and it so far it's come up with this as its best match it's trying all these other ones and for each of them it's in fact trying it if we go click on calibration it's trying it five times each five different realizations uh for each combination of parameter values it's going to try this combination of parameter values, try it five times, each of which will exhibit different results, and then a, a judge it. It'll then, you know, judge that versus previous ones. It'll try another set five times um, with the same parameter values, judge that. And it's trying to grope its way through with, uh, with these uh, stochastic uncertainty in order to find the very best match. The, the values for those parameters that will allow it to best match the uh, this this uh, this data, and it found it at three point two four point one eight six. It it found the best possible match. So here, the model's emergent behavior, the number of people who are infected over time, that's the blue curve on, on a given run with some particular set of parameters, we're trying to get it to best match this yellow curve of data from the world. That's the idea. And, and in the calibration, there's a lot of information that has to be specified over what ranges do you want to range the contact rate and the infection probability, what possible ranges of values will you consider, and how do you judge its goodness of fit here? And how long do you keep on trying for how many combinations of parameter values, different combinations of parameter values are you going to try? In this case, it's 500. And each of them, how many times are you going to run it because of stochastics? Five times. So it's going to run it five times over because it knows it doesn't want to say this is good or this is bad as a result of a fluke. It wants to to get a judicious reading on how good or how bad it is. It's the idea behind calibration. And, and it's a, you know, a real asset of, of these sort of models because it allows you to make use of all these observations of the world that can't be used directly to put in for the assumption about a parameter. These observations in the world that aren't about parameter A or parameter B or parameter C or D in isolation, they're emergent features of a system out there in the world involving many interacting processes. And we have a little model that tries to capture many of those processes. And we want to, to have some confidence about the model. We want it to be as close in what it can produce in the world as, as possible. This is the overall idea of calibration. But I'm deliberately overly simplifying this up front to, con to convey some broad regularities. Already we've seen some texture, texture involving you know, stochastics and which parameters you match and what's our criteria for how well we match it and what data against what data do we match. So there's already some texture coming out, but there's some more. And I want to I want to switch to to look at some additional components with a different model. So I'm going to ask you to open up now uh, a, a separate model, and this model is also on the course site, um, but it it's several models up. It's called SIRS. Crowding disparities version 13 with stratified projected state space. <clears throat> so I'd like you to download that model and load it up as well. Okay. And you may recognize some of these models from, from past discussions. That model is no exception. Um, we we talked about uh, this model in, in terms of. Uh, network structure and uh, some of the ways in which agent attributes 
involving disparities might be reflected in that, that agent structure. But um, for now, we're going to be focused on another feature of it, a feature of its emergent behavior. So SIRS, crowding disparities version 13, was ratified projected data space. Words that will become more significant in coming weeks. OK, so I'd like you to, to open that up. And I'm going to do the same here. And here we go. OK, so this model also is a variant on a familiar refrain. So we have susceptible, infected, and recovered individuals. And individuals lose immunity after some period of time. Uh, and uh, it's given by a duration of immunity. Okay. Um, here, these individuals, if we go to Maine, are placed in a distance-based network with a connection range of 75. And if we zip back to person, we'll see that they contact, in contrast to the last model, their neighbors in their network. So that maybe they're connected with four others, and they'll when they engage in a contact, they will contact a particular neighbor with this message that exposes them to pathogen. And if that neighbor is infected, or sorry, susceptible, they'll get infected for sure. Okay, that's the idea. So let's um, let's go run this model if we may. Um, so uh, the SIRS crowding disparity model. I'm going to run it with a large population. Okay, here we go. And you'll see this population is laid out according to income. So these are higher, you may recall, these are higher income individuals and lower income individuals, and there's more crowding than lower income individuals. Um, and there's an infection taking place is indicated by these colors. So green is, is for susceptible. Uh, Red indicates someone who's currently infected, and gray, uh, someone who is who is who is immune, and there's infecting infection spreading over this network. Now you'll notice up above there's some uh, outcomes over time, and if we plot them out, we will see some ups and downs. And I'm going to stop this in a minute so it doesn't scroll scroll too far. Now there's some other stuff going over here on the right that we'll be exploring before the end of this class. I mean, before the end of this uh, course. But you'll notice what I want to draw your attention to is an endemic situation, something that's going on here, but involves these kind of mini outbreaks. Initially, there was a big outbreak reflecting the fact that many, many people were initially starting susceptible. And, it, and the infection swept through the population, infected a great many of those people. But after that, it's kind of knocked around a bit. It, you have these periods where it's somewhat lower and periods that goes up almost by a factor of two to a higher level. And if you were to run this out for a longer time, it might go extinct or might go down to very high levels and exhibit a real jump um, in infection. Now, I wanna draw your attention also to the fact that this particular scenario is based on a random seed. So if you were to look at this and note, for example, that time 300, the number of people infected was low. Um, or time 800, it reached this historic peak, the highest peak since the top. I'm going to run it again. I'm going to run it and we'll see, see what happens um, in terms of that timing. So we're going to run it out. And does anyone want to guess what will happen? Anyone want to hazard a guess? What do you think we'll see? Will it be the same as that graph? 
or different? You notice here the infection is starting over here on the higher income individuals. It doesn't even reach the, you know, the crowded tenements and um, uh, these these uh, crowded individuals, but it's sweeping in from the higher income areas to the lower here. And now it's about to hit very, very high level. So this one actually had a considerably delayed start. But once again, we see a broad regularity. We see it, it really took off and we see actually though a much steeper peak than we did last time. And we'll see if that regularity that we talked about before, you know, holds true. So for example, time 800, is it going to be at a peak uh, high? And the answer is no, it's not at a particular peak at, at 800. Um, in fact, it's at a low ebb. The timing of this is, is variable, but there are some regularities. If we were to run this again here, and I'm going to make sure this last one is filled, yeah. I'm gonna run it one more time and we'll see some conserved properties and we'll see some properties that are highly variable. So this conserved one, we see a big outbreak at the beginning. This one took off more immediately than the last one, but in both cases, within the first 50 or so, there was a, there was a sizable outbreak. Here, it's not particularly low at 800, it's not particularly high, but once again, we have the flavor of these you know, same basic patterns. It's sort of a big outbreak initially, and then it kind of dawdles along and sometimes goes higher, sometimes goes lower, uh, varying by, by a significant factor, but probably never more than about a factor of two um, in, in for most of the time. And we see, okay, there are sometimes actually it's quite low and times where it goes to, goes higher, but you know there's some there's some variability here. Um, we're not uh, there's a certain characteristic timing to this that may not be um, exactly periodic, but it's also not totally you know uh, chaotic in its in its timing. Um, there is some sort of major Fourier components, some major periodicities that seem to be exercised in terms of timing between these peaks, but they're not highly, highly predictable. There's a lot of chance. And so it is, whoa, um, so it is with things in the world. If we go, if we go look, so I'm going to switch to slides. If we look historically, um, what we'll see in the world is patterns that are much like that. We'll see some broad regularities, a certain orderliness of it. Here we see pertussis uh, at the top uh, for England. And then for Wales here, apologies that it's not um, clear from the from the descriptions here. Here we're going to see chickenpox in Saskatchewan uh, over time, over many many decades, and we'll see an ebb and flow, but never quite, you know, precisely periodic. For uh, pertussis here, you might see cycles on average, you know, something like every four or five years, but you can see times where it was, you know, uh, not, not really in stasis between these times, times where there were somewhat longer intervals, somewhat shorter intervals, truncated outbreaks, for example. 
with chickenpox as well. There are some years that are very big outbreaks and some that are that are small. Um, here's measles and mumps in, in Saskatchewan over, over many years. And again, you, you get a sense of certain major frequencies, but it's never quite periodic. Now, if this is the empirical data we're getting from the world, and we're asking the model to match it, the situation is, is not nearly as neat as when we were matching that yellow curve just a few minutes ago, adjusting the parameters to match this, this curve. We might be on setting ourselves up for a fool's errand if we try to precisely anticipate, for example, in what years pertussis is going to take off versus not, you know, 20 years ahead of time. Um, or, or same thing for chickenpox and the pre-vaccination era. If we were to try to figure out exactly what years it'll have a, a high ebb and what years will be medium and what years will be sort of truncated, we might be setting ourselves up for, you know, an unrealistically large challenge because there's a lot of vagaries of stochastics here. There's a lot of chance events. These days, those chance events may include international travel, for example. It may include, um, you know, new, new lineages of a virus or or of a uh, uh, of a bacterial uh, infection. The emergence of new antimicrobial strains. Trying to trying to anticipate twenty years from now the exact timing of a peak. It's probably a fool's errand, but we can expect to try to create, try to match some broad regularities for sure. Maybe the, how frequently on average those peaks occur. Maybe they're overall burden. Maybe aspects of the autocorrelation, the fact that if you have a big peak now, you're unlikely to have, you know, in, in this month, you're unlikely to have another big peak for a number of months. You know, if you have a, a big peak here in 1969, uh, you're unlikely to have another big peak for the next three, four years. Something that might be revealed by auto autocorrelation. So we might expect that there are some statistical properties here that we try to match even if we can't match the exact timing of the vagaries of the up and down associated with these time series. It's kind of like if you were building a really good hydrological model of the mighty South Saskatchewan River that flows not two kilometers from here. Um, even the best hydrological model, you wouldn't expect it to anticipate the exact timing of when each wave laps the piers of the university bridge yonder. Um, we wouldn't expect that at all. Um, we'd, we'd expect it to be able to anticipate the impacts of spring flooding and, and how different levels of sediment in the water might affect flow and uh, the ways in which the river would would, would carve out its channel more one year to another or, or how it might flow over deep or shallow um, riverbeds. But we wouldn't expect it to anticipate the vagaries of exactly when it rains or you know when each wave would would rise or fall. That would be that would be a full error. So if we're building a model for years from now to anticipate, the broad patterns of what, what we might see to start to plan policy rather than trying every day to give updates. You know, trying to match these patterns exactly is, is setting ourselves up for, for failure. Rather, we want to capture the conserved features, things like autocorrelation functions of these, things like the overall burden things having to do with the, the, the size of the peaks, 
um, things having to do with, with their frequency, et cetera. So, so calibration in a stochastic system um, involves these extra textures because flukes happen and the world is an example of just one realization, just one of a set of possibilities from a stochastic perspective. It could have been different. And never did we see that more than in the COVID-19 pandemic early on, right? Um, here in Saskatchewan, the chance event of an infected server at a snowmobile rally set off an outbreak. The fact that a bunch of um, injudicious uh, uh, physicians and other healthcare workers went to a bond spiel in March 2020 held in, in a city in another province and were exposed to COVID there from someone who had flown back from South America. Um, these are chance things, but they shake the case counts observed in any one week in big ways and other ways. And it's too much to ask a model to exactly match those. But we can ask it to match these regularities, the fact that there are these broad patterns that will be repeated. And really when we're talking about calibration for agent-based models, that's what we're shooting for. So let's talk about this. Bearing in mind the humility we have to bring to the occasion, and that we're going from a perspective of point matching that's very common in some domains. If you're viewing slow, slow moving processes like the number of diabetic cases over time to instead matching these broad features and statistical regularities. So let's go talk about calibration. Now calibration fits in and some who have taken my course in system data science will recognize this slide. Calibration fits in as a particularly simple, widespread, accessible, well-supported method within the broader canon of methods to allow us to do inference from observed data and allow us to do what's called filtering from observed data to estimate the latent state of, of, the, of the underlying system. Um, a point I'll, to which I'll probably return before the end of the class a little bit. So here, calibration is involved in the process of parameter inference. We're trying to arrive at some best guesses for parameters that allow us to reproduce these patterns from the world. Where here, the patterns from the world are things like matches to autocorrelation functions, matches to overall burden, matches to you know, percent of drug resistance in the, in the manure or what have you, the, um, uh, the you know, the, uh, uh, the frequency with which outbreaks occur or the monthly, the monthly totals of people admitted to ICU. Um, it's one of a set of approaches and, and there are more sophisticated ones. And if time allows in this class, I have a lecture on it scheduled, we may talk about approximate Bayesian computation, MCMC, where approximate Bayesian computation uh, will be the focus because it can be used with uh, stochastic systems um, that are common in agent-based modeling, as well as with deterministic systems. One thing that's outside the, the scope of this course, but which I may comment on are, are techniques to, to engage in latent state inference. And to constantly realign a model's internal understanding of the world with what we see from the world. So it's always kept fresh up to date and it's recurrently regrounded with observations from the world. We may return to that issue. It can be performed with agent-based modeling, but it, the, the techniques there are, are quite expensive. Um, okay, so what is calibration? We situate it here. 
I think of calibration as taking diverse data sources from the world, just diverse sources of empirical evidence, ladies and gentlemen, and tuning the assumptions of our models to best match those and listening for signs that our model just doesn't cut it. Listening for signs that our model may, be, may need to be adjusted, that the structure just doesn't jibe with what we see from the world. But generally speaking, we go about that process to try to arrive at parameter estimates for parameters that are less well-known, that where we don't have good evidence. And the idea is we want our model to have to have face plausibility, it needs to account for these patterns in the world. And we want confidence that it can account for these for these patterns in the world. So here, the sort of defining feature or a very important feature of what we're trying to map from the world is things that are emergent patterns from the model and from the world. They can't be reduced to any one parameter, contact rate. If, look, if, if we have data from the world about people's contact rates, maybe we have it from smartphone data, or we have data about mask wearing um, uh, prevalence over time from uh, direct observation uh, or from diarizing with smartphone-based data collection or what have you, we can plug that into a model as a parameter value. It, it, we don't have to calibrate against it. But if we have data from the world about emergent processes, we can't plug it into the model as an assumption. There's no, there's no one assumption for it, but we can make sure the model stays consistent with it, has fidelity to it, stays true to it, can reproduce it, can, can generate it. And there are times and many times where we learn from this that our model structure just can't produce the patterns. And there are other times yet, ladies and gentlemen, mark my words, where we will learn that the data just doesn't cut it and that the flaw lies not with ourselves and with our models, but with the data. Many times in my career, at least five times, have I striven with models labored to calibrate them adequately to data. Racked my, my modeling knowledge to try to find some way to adequately match the data and decided that I just can't account for this data for the world. And I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with my representation of the situation in the model or which of my parameters are way off. And I have beaten the paths to those more knowledgeable about the situation in the world and the data. And they've said, oh yeah, that's because this data is problematic. This changed or that changed. The definition of how we define this was altered during these couple of years that you can't match or or you know, there was a problem with the data collection in those years, or it's known to be unreliable for this time periods. And, and in fact, I learned to be a lot more savvy about that data. But the point is calibration is a learning opportunity. It's a learning opportunity for us to learn where our models just don't measure up, to learn how our models work, how they think, so to speak. We learn to think like our models, and we learn better about the data. So what is calibration doing? It helps us find a reasonable specifics for our for this dynamic hypothesis that's captured in the world, this dynamic hypothesis that explains the observed data. And as I said in the first day of class, it's not that the model embodies truth, but calibration is a process that feeds us to the truth by allowing us to identify a model that just doesn't cut it, that can't align with this empirical evidence and has to be reconsidered. It challenges us in good ways, um, you know, critiques our model. It allows us to learn about the data. And it allows us to be, to, to develop a certain understanding of what this data is telling us. And it helps us leverage this large amount of data that's often available 
in this diffuse way from the world, but where we can't plug it in for any one parameter. It helps us turn that into parameter values. It helps us undercut and challenge our models. So how does this all work? Well, you saw it in that model earlier. It, it, it's using a global optimization. So if we were to go back here to that SIR, the, the SIR agent-based calibration, and we were to run it again here, you notice it, it, it strives, it too strives mightily to try to match this observed data. It's adjusting parameters to, to minimize this discrepancy, this difference between what the model shows and what the observed data is telling us. It tries to get the model to best match, to get as close to them. And it does that by optimizing. This is engages in a global optimization where it's adjusting these parameters to minimize this discrepancy, to make them as close as possible. Whoa. Um, so there's a global optimization. Um, and uh, it runs the model many thousands of times. And uh, the data, um, which often, it could be in the form of a time series, often it is, but then from which we may extract certain measures involving overall burden or, or um, prominent uh, Fourier components, prominent frequencies uh, that are represented or, or notable or autocorrelation of it or cumulative distribution of, of uh, outbreak sizes. Uh, it informs the, the objective function. So we're trying to match in the objective function, trying to match the models, what the model produces with the corresponding thing observed from the world across these many different types of observation. So what do we have to specify for calibration? Well, we have to say what, what we want to match and, and how we match it, sort of how we judge goodness of fit. And we call it variously an error function, not to be confused with the error function in statistics or discrepancy function or penalty function or for physicists in the audience, an energy function. Uh, and, and this specifies the discrepancy, it specifies how far off the model's production is for autocorrelation, for cumulative, uh, distribution for peak size, for major major dominant modes, for overall number of cases. How how close do those match pairwise against data from the world, corresponding data from the world? And beyond that, we have to say what parameters do we want to, to vary and over what ranges? That's what was in this model here, right? We we, in this calibration, we say, hey, go vary contact rate and probability over this range to try to find the best value in that range. And then what sort of optimization algorithm do we want to use? So it's like we have this cube here, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, where we have, I mean, I've chosen a cube, but in general, it's a, it's a hypercube. It, it, it can involve as few as one axis, which would be one parameter. If it had two axis, it would be kind of a, a rectangle. You know, one parameter mu and another parameter tau. If you have three parameters, it's a cube. And, and, and there's one parameter for each of the, the axes here. And what you're trying to do here is you're trying to find where in the cube for what combination of parameter values the model will best match the empirical data. So if you think about it, for a given point inside this cube, you know, its value going into the slide will indicate its value for data. Its value along here, you know, in this dimension will indicate its value for mu. And its value here along this axis will indicate its value for tau. So a point in here 
any one point is going to have a value of beta, mu, and tau. And we're trying to say for that point, if we were to assume those parameter values for the model, how good is the fit of the model to the data? And we do it for another such point, and another one, and another one. We explore this cube to try to find in the quest for the best match, the single best match of model output with what we observe. We're searching just as we searched here, just as we were, you know, trying different parameter values. Um, in this case, you could think of it as searching through uh, uh, just the, the face of this, of this cube. You know, it's like it's changing mu and tau, just it's and it's and it's exploring and exploring different possible parameters, and trying to do so in a savvy way so that it's remembered the best ones so far and uses that to find other good ones and getting better and better um, matches. And after five hundred iterations, it will take the best it found. And so if we ran this out to its completion as we did before, it would it would it would use that that final one. Okay. Um, okay, so you know, key need here of all these things we have to specify. There's this is specifying the parameters to vary and and by implication the range over which to vary them. Each will vary within a certain range, say. And then for a given value parameter to figure out how good it is, we need some measure of this goodness of fit to figure out how closely they match. And there's a set of criteria that are really nice to have for this match to empirical data. Um, and because we'll be spending next time also on this topic, I think I'll go light on this today, but I'll come back to it next time. The basic features are we want a way of matching data from the world that will allow us to, to, to be balanced in our judgment to avoid putting accidental total weight on one measure versus another. And, I'm matching cases instead of matching deaths. We want to want to do a good job for both, not just match only cases well, um, or not just throw out what we care about cases to match death really well. We want to we want to match uh, both pretty well, and 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 that's associated with with being concave here. Um, and we we want to be able to add those up and not just prefer a match to a number that happens to be bigger versus and and ignore things that happen to be smaller like like uh, case positivity rate or something like that um ignoring that in favor of cases because the number for cases is larger that wouldn't make sense we want a dimensionless quantity um and it should be weighted often because often we care more about for the model purpose certain things than others um and generally, it, it should be symmetric if we're off by a factor of two, whether or at half the value or two times the value would be kind of nice. It, it should be non-negative. We shouldn't be able to cancel out how badly we're doing matching deaths because we're doing super good for matching cases. Um, uh, and, and it shouldn't be infinite. So this is one way of doing it if you want to do point matching. But as I said with, and I'll, I'll come back and talk about this more last time, but um, uh, as I said, we were often interested in looking at abstracting certain measures from the data, not just matching point by point, the model value and the observed value H, the historic value. But instead, we're interested in being true to certain certain 
sort of statistical measure. So this from some of the work by Wade and, and Karsten and Alex Doroshenko with me. And, and, you know, here we might be interested in and ask you about, okay, what's the relative risk from the model um, of, of being infected compared to um, based in your time since your last vaccine dose for a kid or, or, you know, what's the cumulative density of yearly incidents? So some years you have lots and lots of incidents and some very few. What's your overall burden? How does it distribute among age groups? What's the autocorrelation like? Um, measuring sort of, if you have a big outbreak in one year, what, you know, what does that mean about subsequent years in terms of the likelihood of having, having um, uh, large numbers of, uh, of cases in those years? And a uh, very high autocorrelation, not only for the index year, but for the next year would say, well, if you have high right now, you're very likely to have high next time. If you have low now, you're low next time. But this is um, uh, this is suggesting a an autocorrelation function that drops off. Um, so there's there's um, uh, in fact negative um, uh, autocorrelation for for this year here, for example. Um, uh, and here it also induced, for example, agent contact patterns, which can be compared with, with data from data on contact patterns that they call the polymod study, for example. So we'll come back and talk about this, um, but the basic gist is often we, we don't want to go engage in matching each of these points. We wanna match these, these sort of broad patterns from them all. So we're going to look at this, and we're going to look at at some of the differences here. For for those from biostatistical background, this may remind you a little bit of regression. You're estimating parameters for a certain model using empirical data and arriving at you know estimates for your coefficients. Um, it it might seem in some ways similar, but it turns out there's some profound differences. And we'll talk about those next time. Um, most notably here, we're dealing with emergent behavior from a model whose functional form is not specified. It's There's no expression of what it does over time. It rather is uh, emerges, it's generated by the model. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about, um, um, optimization, how it occurs, a uh, little bit more about, um, uh, about how we so judge goodness of fit and um, a little bit about how it, how it takes place and how we deal with stochastic. So um, that's all for today. So this is calibration one. And next time we'll finish up the rest of calibration and uh, and talk about you know some of what's needed to deliver on it practically, and we'll see how in any logic it's implemented with the OptQuest global optimization algorithm. So that's all for today, um, and I'm going to stop the recording.